Hey, welcome back. Today, I'd like to ask a very important question. Who here has API documentation at work that they consider accurate and 100% up to date? Raise your hands. No hands? That's what I thought. So on that note, I bring you the next in the thrilling series, Cool Tools. When we talk about API documentation, we're talking about basically three main flavors. The first flavor is API Blueprint, and it's a markdown-based flavor. Uh, the second two flavors are Open API. So there's Open API V2, which you might know as Swagger, because they went under a rebranding. Swagger was a private thing, and Open API is now a, an open uh, schema. And uh, Open API version 3 is kind of like the newer version of that. So it is Open API through and through. It's never been called Swagger, but people will still call it that. And in the Dread docs, they do say it's experimental. It's actually stable now. So Open API v3 is stable and usable, and you should probably be using v3. Um, if you don't like YAML, you could do the JSON version of Open API um, because you can convert to and from JSON and YAML quite easily. So that's an option. But for the most part, just bite the bullet, use the YAML, and use Open API. Now, what does Open API and API Blueprint actually do? It's a way of annotating what endpoints you're going to have within your API. It's going to—it's a way of annotating what uh, arguments or like body. Uh, you can send to an endpoint and what you're going to get back as a response. So it's a way of annotating uh, possible error codes, possible uh, success codes, and just anything that your API is going to do, you need to document somewhere because you don't want surprises for your users. The first thing we should probably talk about with Dread itself is the config file. And in that config file, you're going to have a way of configuring whether you should launch a local server. You can pass in a command that Dread will run for you. You can have it hit a remote server and have Dread hit do requests against that by setting your base URL. You can do a lot of configuration, and there's really just too much config to cover. So I really do encourage you to dig into the config and see if there's anything that makes it more useful to you, right? If there's some edge case that I haven't had to use, yes, you should probably look into that yourself because I'm not going to be able to cover everything. One of the most powerful things about Dread.js is the hooks. And actually, without the hooks of Dread, it basically doesn't do anything. It just runs HTTP requests without any knowledge of how to hit the API or how the tokens work or any of that. It just uses what's in the YAML file. And typically, you don't have a token in that YAML file. You don't have a username and password. How do you log a user in, grab a token, and then hit your authenticated API to make sure things work? Well, that takes a bit of effort. So technically, Dread now has these hooks, and you hook into the Dread process. There's going to be before, before all before an individual test, right? You can do after, after all. There's just a bunch of hooks that you're kind of used to from like other testing frameworks that are going to be really useful to hook into and do various things functionality-wise, such as storing a token, such as uh, using a previously generated ID to then update that same resource. There's just a whole bunch of things that you're going to want to maybe grab as a response from the server, save for later, and then use in a request later. So, but. That is the process, and I think it's very useful. You think you're smart, don't you? Now that we know what hooks are, we should actually look at a real-world use case for them. So in a bunch of my apps, I end up needing to do a login, right? And we end up needing tokens to authenticate to an endpoint. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at our stash. Our stash is where these values get stored for later. It's just a naming convention. Uh, and you don't have to name it that way. You could even do just let variables. You could do any sort of like mechanism you want to keep these values for later. Stash is just a good naming convention to make sure that we're not mixing these up with other ephemeral values that we might be creating inside of our tests. So stash is just nice and easy for readability. Main thing we're going to do is, in this before all hook, this before all hook runs before all of our tests just once, and we're going to go log in with some hard-coded values and those hard-coded values are going to come back with a token we can use for our other endpoints. That token then gets set on the stash, and then we can just call that stash value later when we want to attach that token to our headers. It's a very clean pattern and pretty easy to understand. So now we know how the stash works a little bit with that before all hook, but now let's actually uh, see what it looks like inside of an, uh, another hook, right? Like maybe getting a transaction from this API. So in that case, we're going to want to get this transaction. And at the beginning of this hook, before this test runs, we want to maybe create a transaction so that we can get it. We want to do that so that we can make sure these things run in parallel, possibly. We don't want to make sure that this has to run after some other test, right? besides our before all. 
So we're going to create a new uh, transaction, and we're just going to take our access token from the stash and put it into our bearer token as an authorization header. And then we can just create this transaction, and once we get it, we can get the transaction ID from it and do a get for that after it's on our stash. So boom, we can just replace that chunk in our URL where we have a hard-coded colon transaction ID, and then that's going to get replaced with our newly created created transaction ID. And it's just nice and easy. We get to replace that, and the test is going to run as we expect. And it's going to check to see that the response comes back with what we're expecting. So that newly created transaction is going to get validated. And that is more of like how the hooks will work in the future. You've done an excellent job on the chalkboard. Thank you, Miss Ram. So that's the basics of Dread.js. I'm not trying to cover the whole thing. I'm not trying to give you a full giant walkthrough. But at least you're familiar with it now, and you can go research it and look into it yourself. I'm already using Dread in a bunch of projects. I use it in pretty much anything I, where I have an API that I want to expose to other people. And it's especially important in a project I have called Walter. In Walter, I generate client SDKs, which are, you know, you can get types into your language that you care about. You can get, you can have it hit our API using a client instead of having to manually do your Axios stuff. And we can generate these SDKs for all sorts of languages using Open API Generator. So that's another reason why you want to make sure you're documenting your API. You want to make sure that it's in a format that these things support, like OpenAPI. And then you can use that OpenAPI doc to validate your API and produce client SDKs. And when you know that your client API is actually accurate, your client SDKs are more trustworthy. So it's a very nice workflow of making sure your API is accurate for these client SDKs that have to be accurate. So hope that was fun. Hope you enjoyed it. And I hope to see you next time. Later.